Hi, my name is Darren McAvoy. Thank you for that introduction. I'm a uh, Forestry Extension Program Associate here at Utah State University. My job is mostly uh, directing the Utah Forest Landowner Education Program. I write the Utah Forest News and put on annual timber harvest tours. But an important part of my job is to encourage utilization of forestry products, wood products uh, in and around Utah. And to that end, I'm the co-chair of the Utah Biomass Resources Group. Today's presentation, I'm going to introduce you to the, the UBRG, That's some of the things, update you, that, uh, if you're already familiar with us, uh, different things that we've got going on, and, and talk about different technologies and biomass utilization, um, and talk a little bit about biochar, introduce you to that topic and, and what it is and what it might be potential or uh, able to do. Um, and I'm going to start off with a picture of a country rock band, uh, the Muddy Boots Band, uh, playing in on Main Street in Beaver, Utah last summer. And why would I start off a biomass presentation with a, a picture of a local country rock band? Because this was Utah's first ever wood-fired concert. Here's the Muddy Boots Band under the pavilion on the green, Main Street in Beaver. Uh, Mark Nelson, uh, Beaver County Extension agent, was flipping burgers for the crowd. Lots of family folks came and went, and, and uh, some produce, local producers, and, and got an idea about what the potential of making energy from wood was all about. Featured at that show and others, this is at the uh, Davis County Gardener's Market last fall. Um, here's our dragon wagon. This is the vehicle that produces uh, electricity from wood through gasification. And our operator there, you can barely see, um, Steve Walker making it work, making power in this uh, situation for a, a taco cart uh, that was had for up to 600 people uh, you generally uh, attend this evening uh, farmer's market event. Here's the Dragon Wagon in its uh, inception. For $100, the Utah Forest Landowner Education Program purchased this vehicle from the Air Force, really on an intergovernmental transfer. <clears throat> we wrapped it up and made it look all pretty like you see above. And the guts of the vehicle is the gasifier. Here in the background is my uh, uh, co-host uh, uh, with the Biomass Resources Group, Dallas Hanks, uh, checking it out. Dallas brings us a lot of our um, energy uh, technology, uh, brings up our awareness of it, um, and we really thank him for that. Congratulations and shout out to Dallas. Just uh, finished his PhD, Dr. Dallas Hanks. Um, so here's the gasifier. In the, in the main chamber, um, the wood is cooked, mostly in the absence of oxygen oxygen at very high temperatures, 800 degree Celsius. Um, and then there on the left, that box with the gray top, is uh, a propane generator, just a normal one I purchased at Lowe's. And in between, there's a lot of filters and stuff. And basically, we cook the wood, so it just turns into gases. And all the gases come off. It's a lot like propane. We run it into this propane generator and produce about 8 kilowatts of power, enough for approximately two homes or one country, country rock band. Woody biomass, it's organic, local, secure energy. The Utah Biomass Resources Group is made up of a variety of different partners, including, including the Bureau of Land Management, the USDA Forest Service, uh, USU uh, Cooperative Extension leads the group with Dallas and I and, and uh, the leadership of uh, Chuck Gay as well. And the Utah Department of Ag and Food has been a, a big uh, supporter. We got our biomass, uh, our, our uh, a Woody Biomass Grant, a Fuels for Schools program grant through the Department of Ag and Food that uh, powers the Dragon Wagon. And also we have always worked closely with the DNR, Utah, Department of Forestry, Fire, and State Lands, and a lot of our efforts. What we focus on, in, for starters, is the pinion juniper resource in Utah. Um, it uh, 
it, it's a it's a beautiful resource. I was down uh, looking at a biochar project yesterday um, by Milford and stopped on the way home. Did a little jog by Eureka, stretched my legs on the long drive, and and uh, definitely made a point of stopping uh, where I could see and, and jog in the uh, the pinion juniper resource. It's, it's gorgeous woodlands. Uh, we've got about 10 million acres of it across Utah, um, and, and we really believe that it, it needs taken care of. Our concern with the PJ, we, as we call it, resource is that it's too much of a good thing. Um, right now, there's an approximate 100 million acres of PJ across the West. And so this isn't just a Utah problem, but it, it's a West-wide problem. And here, just in the Intermountain West, we've got almost 50 million acres. And here you can see it in the red. Um, and so it's occupying lots of acres. And according to a lot of research uh, by Dr. Robin Tausch and others, it's increased by 10 times the number of acres that it covers since European settlement of the West. And uh, his re research also shows that it's going to fill in and densify uh, those acres by three times in the coming decade. So it's increased by 10 times. It's about to densify by three times. So it's a problem of expansion and densification across its range. And uh, some of the pretty cool research that Tausch and others do show that uh, it's marching north uh, at a, a rate of about a football field per year. And here's the northern uh, extent of its range. This is up by City of Rocks, up on a family camp and weekend. Um, it's a national <clears throat> monument, I think. Uh, a uh, beautiful place for hiking and camping and rock climbing and such. And uh, and here's a, a jay sitting on a pinion. And this is about as far north as the pinion goes, but the juniper does continue to go further north uh, up into Oregon, different, different types of juniper. But as you can see in this hillside in the background, very dense stands, uh, very filled in. And that's the concern. Um, here we've got some treated stands in the foreground, and in the background it's untreated. Um, so they classify it. Uh, ecologists classify the, the the amount of density in stage one, stage two, and stage three. A lot of the foreground is stage two, and the, that upper part of the hillside is stage three, completely filled in where the branches are branches are touching each other, and it, it becomes a depauperate uh, landscape on the ground. Nothing is really growing, and the concern with this type of um, the, the ecological concern is that it's an ecological disaster waiting to happen. Um, uh, fire can can and will and does get into this community and it rips. It, 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 uh, uh, I've seen it quite a bit myself and and seen the after effects. And often the after effects, is, is unfortunately, is cheatgrass. And this is what we're trying to prevent, um, is a complete cheatgrass invasion um, of these types of landscapes by careful management. And here in, in the mid-ground, you can see where the, the browner soils are exposed. They recently harvested that or thinned it back uh, for fire suppression uh, and, and fire hazard mitigation purposes. This can increase the safety for firefighters as they're trying to work in this area. This is just adjacent to I-15, just south of, of Beaver, uh, Utah, uh, uh, by exit 109, Never Shine Hollow. It can, it's visible from the highway as, as you head down towards Cedar on the right side of the highway. And uh, um, what we want it to look like is in, in, the, in the very foreground um, where it, it's green underneath, lots of forbs and grasses growing. Hopefully, natives uh, will be encouraged as much as possible and uh, uh, a, a more open stand of pinion and juniper so that when a fire does come, it doesn't necessarily just burn through the canopy. And through this kind of work, making a, <clears throat> excuse me value out of the pinion and juniper, we hope to be able to treat more acres on the ground and, and, and uh, make a positive impact on, on these. Because right now, this is costing um, upwards of $300 to $600 an acre to treat acres like this. And the BLM is currently treating 40,000 acres per year just in Utah like this. So economically, it can't go on this way. And, and we believe that we should make uh, some value out of this value, this right now wasted resource. 
so we hope to sort of cut our teeth and and prove our the, what we can do on this uh, PJ resource, but hope to uh, with the success there because it's so available, move upland and, and into the cities, upland uh, to slash piles like this and into the cities. Uh, we have a lot of arborists on, I believe today, and it looks like a, and uh, you know into the into those limb piles that you guys are pulling off all day long. And so I'm going to introduce you to a couple technologies and and products that we hope can can help to make that happen. Um, also working in other invasive species types, uh, uh, including uh, Russian olive, uh, a lot of interest in working in the, the salt cedar along the rivers, corridors down south, and, and also Phragmites. There's uh, our partner with the Division of Forestry, Fire, and State Lands. They oversee the sovereign lands. That's the lands beneath the rivers and lakes, and much of the land uh, are in and around Utah and the Great Salt Lake has been overtaken with this uh, invasive swamp reed called Phragmites. And it's um, it, Phragmites is uh, it's been referred to as Western switchgrass as far as potential as an energy crop, and we've harvested some with uh, division cooperation and tested it in some of the machines I'm about to introduce to you, and uh, it's very promising uh, uh, material for for biomass use, um, and it's got worldwide. Uh, implications. It grows all over the place. I was uh, happened to be taking a train into New York City and uh, explaining biomass stuff to my brothers uh, riding with me and one of them pointed out the window and said, oh, Phragmites, you guys should be working on that. And it was great to turn right back and say, you're right, we are. We're right in the middle of that. Another thing that we're in the middle of, since we're so um, involved with pinning juniper harvest and, and we want to find out the, the best way to get the wood um, uh, off the ground uh, from the stump to the landing. And so we uh, did a cooperative project with Dr. Bob Rummer um, out of the Southern uh, USDA Forest Service Research Station. Um, it looked at three different types of equipment uh, that, that handled pinion juniper differently and and measured with with GPSs and uh, lots of computer measurements and, and every every little move these machines made and their gas and their tire wear and everything was taken into consideration by a team of scientists from the research lab and and they uh, determined, uh, gave us some feel for the best and most economical and efficient way to get the, this off the ground. And this is being followed up with uh, some monitoring from uh, professors uh, uh, Helga von Migrot and, and Kari Veblen here at USU to look at the, the ecological implications um, uh, of, of this type of harvest, uh, monitoring the soils and the vegetation response. And so this is the first and most successful machine, the Ponzi. This uh, cut the material out on the ground um, and had as a yarder behind the machine is what we call it. So it cut it and stacked it into this this uh, forwarding, a uh, forwarder, I'm sorry, a forwarder, not a yarder, a forwarding machine um, and, and brought it to the roadside where it could be uh, taken out for, for utilization from there. And we compared this machine uh, to this one that um, chip the material out on the ground uh, right at the stump. It could cut the tree and, and, and chip it directly into this bin and then uh, deliver uh, chipped wood right to the roadside uh, for use. Um, and the machine that they sent was a little undersized uh, for this one. This is, I guess, uh, only half the size of the previous machine, which did pretty well. It was kind of expensive. This one is a little undersized. Did not really do that well in these these studies. Um, and this one is kind of interesting. The third one, a bio baler. So you can see this big round bale that the machine produced, and uh, just like a, a big hay bale, uh, but out of wood, pinning juniper and some of the the slash and and uh, the, or the, the sage that was that was around it and uh, this had some promise but overall we seemed to uh, prefer the first machine had the least impact on the ground and most cost effective 
This is our website, and uh, this is just a screen capture uh, uh, from uh, this red machine here. Is, is represents another project that we've been working on uh, called co-firing. This is the idea of mixing wood with coal at Utah and other power plants um, to produce energy, to produce electricity. And we've uh, been in negotiation with the carbon power plant. That's the one you see right outside of Price and Price Canyon as you're heading towards Provo. And and uh, um, to get them to mix a 5 or 10 percent uh, mixture in a test run of, of pinion juniper chips with their uh, um, uh, coal in, in that power plant. And these, this, this red machine here is actually uh, resides in downtown Salt Lake City in the southern part of the city. There's a you know, real industrial uh, area. Surprisingly, there's this whole complex. It's the uh, Utah uh, Center for Clean and Secure Energy. And it's a series of warehouses, and they have these scaled down uh, power plant units in each of them that represent uh, different power plants um, and you know, where the scientists like Dr. Eric Eddings, our, our partner there, the dean uh, or assistant dean of the Department of Ag, or Department of Engineering, excuse me, at, at the U, um, uh, ran a, a series of tests that we invested uh, USDA Forest Service funds in, uh, approximately $70,000 of funds, and running these tests to find out exactly how the pinion juniper wood is going to react with the coal. And they had great results. Um, uh, didn't seem to affect the, the 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 fire in any negative way. Um, uh, so we're kind of encouraged by this and, and more on co-firing as I uh, co will, uh, in my wrap-up will compare different technologies that we've, we've been working on. So woody biomass, the problem with it is that it, it's not energy dense. It's mostly air and water. And so it's really expensive to ship um, any distance. And of course, in Utah, it's a really diffuse resource. Our pinion juniper resource only has, you know, six, seven uh, tons per acre uh, on average. Uh, whereas in comparison, you can get many, many hundreds of tons per acre in, in higher biomass systems, northwestern forests, for example. Um, so trying to densify the product, get the air and the wood out of the product before we take it out of the woods is part of the key to the whole thing, it, it appears. And to that end, we're working with this machine. This is a rotary pyrolysis kiln. So pyrolysis is different from gasification, which is the dragon wagon project that makes it all into gas. This cooks the wood at a lower temperature, only 400 degrees C as compared to 800 degrees C, and more controlled uh, environment and, and amounts of uh, oxygen. And um, instead of turning it all into a gas, it turns it into three products. A third of it is this propane-like gas that'll be run back into the system to make it self-sufficient after it's up and running. The two other products are biochar and bio-oil. And what we've done as the UBRG is we've cooperated with the owner of this machine and the inventor of this uh, proprietary technology, this rotary pyrolysis kiln, um, uh, is, is Dr. Uh, uh, Ralph Coates uh, is a uh, retired BYU professor. Salt Lake City has got this shop right next to uh, the Tesoro plant right there, Refinery Row in Salt Lake City. And he's been into petroleum refinery and such all his career. And about five years ago, lucky for us, he's turned his efforts towards woody biomass. And so we've been cooperating with uh, with Ralph to, to build this to take this machine that he already had built and uh, turn it into a mobile pyro pyrolysis kiln. So that's what you're looking at, one of the first in the country, and we think one of the best. Um, there's many different uh, folks in um, China chase after this technology, and, and we're hoping we have a leg up on them with this type, this particular rotary type of, of uh, technology. This one in particular is a half ton, ton, half a ton per day unit. So it's a demonstration unit. It's made to, to show that the technology can be, that it is viable. And we're very deeply in plans to scale it up to a 10 ton per day unit. So the vision, if you will, is to have one of these out next to every 
slash pile that you see making these densified biomass products that we drive uh, out of the woods. Another view of the, the, the the rotary, the mobile pyrolysis kiln in, in process being made. You can see on the front of it, there's a couple of propane tanks that gets the system up and running. And then right next to it is a really large uh, generator uh, that will switch to, that pro provides power for the computers and to run the whole system. Um, and uh, that'll run on the gas that we make, the, the syn gas or producer gas from the system to make it self-sufficient. So it's a self-contained trailer you can pull out into the woods and make these products and so the products as mentioned bio oil biogas or biochar the bio oils you can see a variety of bio oils there um, on, on the foreground that we've made from Frank Mighty's and from pinion juniper and from um, a variety of other uh, locally available feedstock so testing the different oils in different ways one of the challenges with working with bio oils is they're very caustic um, uh, we can make uh, jet fuel out of it, but it costs ten thousand dollars a gallon. So it's not real practical right now, uh, and they're working on that. Um, so uh, in the meantime, uh, we're focusing on other products with the bio oils and, and the biochars. This is another pyrolysis kiln. This one here on the campus, uh, a stationary one uh, on the campus of Utah State University. Uh, here in the gray uh, jacket is Dr. Forrest Aglavor. And this is during a, uh, a tour with Marshall Wright from the depart there on the left from the uh, energy, or the off, the, excuse me, the governor's office of economic development. And so we're working on different products that Dr. Aglavor is producing with uh, the bio oils he makes from his kiln. Here's an example, the oil on the bottom and on top plastic that Dr. Aglavor, who is a U-Star endowed professor here at USU, has produced. So I think this is completely amazing. I've held in my hand this plastic um, that he made from penny juniper wood here on the campus of USU. And he says it's great stuff for making plastic and other high value uh, biochemical materials. And if you look at the um, uh, the models of the petroleum companies. You know, I go to these national biomass meetings and uh, all these people from petroleum companies and this is the kind of thing that they talk about. Um, they're, when we go to the gas pump and we buy our gas, they're not making any money from that. That's a break-even operation. Transportation fuels is what I'm told. All the money, very li a little bit of the product of their original crude, but most of the money, most of the profit comes from bio chemical products like we're looking at here, bio oils, um, uh, adhesives, and plastics. So uh, we're partnering with Dr. Aguivor to, to push those technologies along. On to biochar. And uh, I asked Rose kind of on the fly here if, uh, with an email if she could put up a couple of quick uh, um, uh, polls uh, of for uh, to ask folks if they know in particular yes or no question, do you know about biochar? And and, and uh, a more in-depth question of what you think about the product. So I'd like to introduce you to biochar. I assume uh, many of you have probably never heard of it or not that familiar with it. This is some char that we made at in, 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 out of pinion juniper wood in, in eastern or Eastern Nevada last year at the Pinion Juniper Coalition, um, the Nevada Landscape Coalition, excuse me, partnership um, uh, meeting there. So here's uh, kind of the classic example of uh, this, the history, this uh, story of biochar start. Sorry about the quality of this slide. I just robbed it off the internet from the uh, the, the uh, U.S. Biochar Initiative, and um, the story harkens back to the, the Amazon. And what we've always known about the Amazon is that it's an uninhabited rainforest. Um, it's not inhabited because it's poor soils, like you see on the left. Uh, no horizon, no a horizon in there. All the value, the, the ecological value is wrapped up in the material, the, the biomass, the above ground material. You, you cut it off, you farm it for a few years and you have to move on, hence slash and burn agriculture. Um, and, and this has always been known. 
and flash forward, you know, to kind of today or, or 20 years ago, um, they were they logged the Amazon uh, heavily uh, uh, for grazing lands mostly for the cheap hamburgers I bought on the road last night and. Uh, um, and this Dutch agronomist happens to be flying over the Amazon and sees these straight lines down on, on the forest floor and it doesn't make sense why there would be straight lines on the forest floor and, and when it's never there's never been cities or anything down there and he eventually gets a chance to go down there and, and inspect and he finds these huge embankments of man-made soils they're called terra preta or dark earth soils like you see on the left and they can be 40 and 60 acres in size, and they supported huge cities of people. And um, and what they are is a mixture of uh, biochar, which is the people's just the char from from uh, their cooking and and, and, and heating needs, uh, and uh, their charcoal essentially, and uh, uh, the pot shards, which is their trash, and the uh, compost. So they mixed this all together and it made these super soils. And today, uh, I'm told by uh, Gloria Flora, who's visited there and uh, one of the leaders of biochar in, in, in the U.S., um, uh, that uh, a, a typical Amazon rainforest farmer knows that he can grow five times the amount of vegetables on these terra preta dark earth soils that you see on the right as you can on a typical Amazon Amazonian rainforest soil profile like you see on the left and uh, and they're, they'll they'll pay five times the amount for those acres and so here's one of the cooler things I think I heard from our uh, biomass conference we hosted here a couple of years ago at USU that, that Gloria said that so Here's a gift that um, these local people's ancestors um, gave them 2,500 years ago, these, these amended soils, these so-called super soils. And so with this knowledge, we have an opportunity to give a gift to our ancestors many generations out into the future by amending our soils and making more productive soils through with the use of biochar. This is sort of this is another robbed uh, internet robbed so, uh, photograph, um, but um, this is the poster child for biochar success uh, uh, in the West at least. This is the Hope Mine near Aspen, Colorado, and for years and years uh, the. Uh, they tried to revegetate the slope on the left in many different efforts, thousands of dollars, and no success whatsoever. And then finally, um, they uh, in in 2010 uh, they treated it with uh, with biochar and then revegetated the slope and, and incredible success and so this just stands as the poster child of, of what biochar can do. Um, and I want to just bring to you uh, uh, your attention that it, it's a growing market. It's, uh, we're seeing it in more and more products from, uh, I don't know if we're seeing, I haven't seen it at the local Lowe's, but I expect to see it soon uh, in, in local stores uh, with compost mixes and such. Here's a biochar maker. Again, this was at the Nevada PJ Landscape Coalition meetings and Jonah Levine who produced the biochar for that Hope Mine project is here on the hat on the right um, in, the, in the green shirt and uh, he brought his machine to Nevada kindly to show us how he produces biochar. So there's a variety of different kinds of machines from the pyrolysis kiln that I introduced you to earlier to this machine of Jonah's to this is uh, uh, Dusty Moeller, biocharist from Nevada. And here's a great big biochar maker. You just fill this kiln and it's got a great big top on it. It looks a little bit like Dusty's hat. And uh, you cook the wood in that and, and, and let it cool down. And, and you've got a big old pile of biochar. And we kind of tease each other, call each other biocharist. It's almost uh, a religion, it seems like some, some have said. And, um, but it's got a tremendous amount of potential. Um, I was yesterday, as I mentioned, down in Milford looking at uh, 
doing a, something, trying to do something similar as the Hope Mine and, and the Milford Quarry, a ballast rock uh, mining site just outside of Milford, Utah, and using biochar there, working with uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Grossel here at USU um, to see if we can use biochar to amend those soils uh, and do a scientific study in cooperation with the Bureau of Land Management to see how it does on Utah soils. But he's very encouraged and said that uh, looking at uh, other studies of, of using carbon uh, more, which is very similar, uh, just activated carbon, biochar is very similar to it, and uh, a lot of studies have shown that uh, it will work really good on, on, uh, on this, these sorts of tough sites, um, like out in the Uinta Basin, these mine pads that he's working on so much. Uh, very promising product for that sort of thing, and the research is, is looking very positive that way. And, uh, so little guys involved in it. Biochar is coming all sorts of sizes and shapes. Um, and this one is, uh, uh, this is a biochar kiln, uh, just kind of a homemade backyard job. Um, uh, Dr. Or, uh, I should say uh, Chuck Gay here, uh, Extension Vice President, has his own backyard biochar maker uh, that uh, his, his uh, wife Lou is one of the leading gardeners, I guess you might say, here in the valley, or, and um, big believers and have seen a lot of great results from uh, the, the, what they, their application of biochar in their gardens. And some of the claims are, are you know, you, I mentioned the 2,500 year in the back in, in the future thing, and some of the claims are even more uh, crazy about what biochar might be able to do as, as a way to store carbon in the soil. What it is is a soil amendment. It, uh, um, it doesn't provide nutrients, it doesn't provide moisture, but it makes them available to plants. And uh, it also changes the soil structure, better uh, place for critters to grow, things like that. Um, and, and so a lot of promise that way. And so by storing carbon in the soil, some have claimed that we can actually re reverse the effects of all the carbon we've put into the atmosphere by storing, by outdoing that in a, in a matter of decades by putting more than that kind of carbon storage back into the soil through the use of biochars. And if uh, it's a little outlandish talking about biochar in 2,500 years into the future, I want to, uh, and, and, and plastics from wood, I want to assure you that the UBRG is also focused on more um, down-to-earth things right here at home um, and uh, um, more traditional products, firewood products that, uh, that traditionally come out of the pinyon juniper and other woodland resources in Utah. Um, and uh, uh, and I want to introduce you quickly to this product, um, another biomass product, not an energy product, but uh, you can read about this in uh, the most recent uh, Utah Forest News, and Rose perhaps could put up a link to that in the chat pod. Thank you. And uh, so these are massive wood walls being produced um, in the shop of uh, Kip Apostle with Euclid timber frames. This is uh, by uh, um, Charleston, Idaho. Charles, excuse me, Charleston, Utah, just uh, just south of Heber City. And what he's doing is using beetle kill wood. You can see the, the some of the blue staining and some of the wood here to make this kind of European style wall. It's, I, I'm told very popular there, up to nine inches thick. Of pure wood, but it's beetle kill wood that you can't really use for much else uh, besides this sort of thing. He likes to refer to it as 20th century log home construction. So we visited a home he made uh, out of this type of construction up on the hill, and uh, it's sustainable in the sense that they cut the wood, beetle kill wood, right off the hill, uh, the same property up at Wolf Creek Ranch, brought it 20 miles down the hill, milled it all up in the specialty mills that, that Kip has, and 
and brought it back only 20 miles back up the hill and, and assembled it on site. And so that seems to be a lot more sustainable than bringing in our wood from Brazil or something like that. And uh, many claims about the, the health values and, and uh, the comfort of living in a home like that. And uh, again, uh, for more details, uh, see the most recent issue of the Utah Forest News. Well, I thought I'd just bring a little bit of attention to some of the work that we've been doing for public education and to get producers more aware of the potential of biomass for energy and to produce biochar and these other products. Um, this is a billboard just south of uh, Beaver and I on I-15 last summer we had up all summer and we celebrated our third annual Southern Utah Biomass Field Days um, and had oh, 150 people out each day for equipment demonstrations and um, for a biomass, an annual biomass biomass summit that we've hosted. It's more of an indoor thing with uh, speakers and, and more of a conference style setting. But also we had the Muddy Boots Band play at this uh, evening event and then a field tour of pinion juniper and, and treatments over the last several years. Wanted to mention um, the Restoring the West conference that we held uh, in 2011, uh, focusing on biomass use. You can go to the website there, you see at the bottom, restoringthewest.org. And there's over 30 talks posted there from that conference about biochar and uh, about uh, biomass utilization in and around the West and, and the, e the ecological implications of it and some of the technological uh, end of it as well. So uh, all those talks are archived um, under past conferences conferences at restoringthewest.org. Um, a lot of information is also available in my newsletter, the Utah Forest News, that, that uh, I get a lot of help with from folks that are helping on, on this webcast today. Um, and we featured a half a dozen or more articles on biomass utilization and biochar. So lots of information on, on these topics available here in the Utah Forest News. And oh, we learned a little trick last year. One way to get national uh, attention for your program is to invite the editor of a national publication to, to speak at one of your conferences, which is exactly what we did at last year's uh, Southern Annual Biomass Field Days with the help, help of Lance Lindblom and others. Um, we uh, uh, had Steve Wylent, the editor of this forestry source newspaper, comes out every couple of weeks from the Society of American Foresters, uh, nationally and sent worldwide. And, and uh, Steve is the editor of this, and he had some great things to say to us uh, uh, at our biomass field days. Uh, kind of a national perspective on biomass, but didn't expect this, but it was great uh, uh, sort of boom, boomerang effect that he featured several articles uh, about Utah biomass and the stuff we have going on there in the forestry source, as you can see in the bottom half of the page here. Um, just wanted to uh, point out some of the things going on, you know, even with the advantages uh, that we have of, of using woody biomass um, that I've mentioned here, it becomes uh, more apparent after comparing these to other energy feedstocks, the advantages that woody biomass offers. It's because it's not a fossil fuel, it, and it's not food. It's not corn. Um, it's one of the renewables that offers the potential to produce power regardless of if the wind is blowing or if the sun is shining. This is baseload power that we might be able to make with woody biomass if done on a big scale. And given the energy challenges that we face today as a nation, it makes sense to use this, what is now a waste product, to produce needed energies in commodity, commodities such as bio-oils and soil amendment products such as biochar. Woody biomass, again, it, 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 there's a lot of huge potential here. Um, but on the other hand, there's a lot of challenges. This is that power plant in price, the, the carbon power plant that I mentioned, that big old pile of coal that's black. We're 
we're going to turn it a little bit more brown, mixing 5 or 10% wood in there. But, you know, right now there's no incentives in Utah. There's no regulation. Um, there's no reason that the folks who run this power plant should make their life harder to by mixing in with wood, uh, mix, mixing wood in with coal. You know, when it rains on that, that big pile of coal, that wood is going to absorb water. So that's just one thing. That, and how's that going to affect the whole burning of it? And one of many things. Things, little complications that we can get around, you know, and we did the, what is the world's most extensive extensive uh, literature uh, review on co-firing. It's available on our website, um, uh, but it, it, it's it's full of potential problems. So unless uh, Utah adopts some regulations uh, or something like that, the in environment somehow changes. It's hard to see how that's really going to uh, move forward in Utah at this time. Uh, continuing to compare technologies. We love the Dragon Wagon. It's a great project. It's been fairly successful. We can make power from wood. But and as I mentioned, Steve Walker here on the right, you know, the guy is incredibly talented. I mean, he's an electrician. He's a welder. He's a carpenter. He's got all these talents and skills that he applies to this. And unfortunately, this is what we're finding, is that this is what it takes, is a very talented and skilled individual, all of his or her time, to make this machine run. And that makes it uneconomical. Our idea is, you know, originally is to test this out. Is, can a farmer or rancher get this going on a bucket of wood and it'll run all day long in a bucket of wood and you come back that night and put on a new bucket and keep it running? Yeah, that starts to be practical remote power applied with just wood. But to keep a person there running the thing full time, the economy starts to fade pretty quick. Hence, we're putting our focus into the more into the the mobile pyrolysis, as I mentioned, uh, you know, our vision is to have one of these pyrolysis machines at every slash pile out in the woods, um, and, and we think woody biomass does hold a lot of potential. And again, it, it, it's local, secure, and organic energy. Thank you very much. Here's my contact information. If you have any more questions, um, be happy to contact uh, to, to talk with you or email uh, with you about that. Um, uh, look for upcoming events in the biomass world, and and if you want to stay in touch, you can join our Google groups. Just send uh, send us a chat message with uh, your email address and letting us know that you want to be involved in, in woody biomass utilization in Utah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Darren. We do have a few questions here in the chat pod. I'm sorry, Let's I didn't see you. One person, yep, I'll read them out to you. Don't worry. One person was wondering about tamarisk. I know you focused a lot on pinion and juniper. Are you guys looking at tamarisk, Russian olive, some of those other species? Yes, we are definitely interested in working in those species. A lot of interest in that. Um, you know, I hate the term uh, low-hanging fruit, but that's, that's kind of how, how we see the pinion juniper right now is just what's most available. As I mentioned, uh, hoping to prove our technologies out uh, on this incredibly available resource with the BLM already harvesting 40,000 acres of it all around us every year. Um, and if we can prove our technologies out on that, then uh, hope to move forward into, into other biomass feedstocks such as tamarisk. And, uh, but also at the same time, you know, still doing work on some tamarisk. I don't think we've pyrolyzed any tamarisk just yet, but uh, interested in doing that with more funding available. To follow up on that, Darren, I had a question about incorporating that pyrolysis machine into the urban landscape. Absolutely. Go ahead. It just, is that What's a question? The, my question is, how much ideally would that machine end up being? Would it be equivalent to, say, a chipper of some sort, where a tree crew could go out and prune a bunch of stuff and then put it through that? every day while they were out in the field, maybe a utility pruning company or something? Yeah, we'd like to get there. Um, what I would think, you know, 
guessing at the future a little bit here, how it would work. Well, let me tell you a couple of facts. To, to build a 10 ton per day unit right now, we're looking at three to four hundred thousand dollars to build one. So not every small um, you know, arborist in town is going to be able to buy a 10 ton unit, but maybe a group of arborists or a larger one and maybe cooperatively they could have one um, that and, and centrally located uh, may, maybe. I, I would think with that sort of application you may not need to make it so portable, but on a lot in town or uh, several lots in a big town, several pyrolysis machines in a big town. I mean, at this point, I'm not going to mention any names, but uh, uh, we're in negotiations and have a handshake agreement with Utah's uh, biggest firewood harvester in the southwest, uh, sends all of his wood down to Las Vegas. And right now, he's, he's uh, He's got 10 tons per day he's of refuse that he's chipping up and sending to Las Vegas for 10 bucks a ton for just landscaping chips. And he's more than ready to spend 100,000 of his own money and, and borrow a couple hundred thousand of USDA rural development funds. We're working up the applications with him right now um, to, to make this happen to purchase his own 10 ton per day um, unit. So somebody who produces that much, yeah, they could use a big unit. But another example example we have going is a, a landowner uh, uh, in the southern part of the state up on the Tavaputs um, um, is more interested in something like a one ton per day unit and so ideally you could see all sizes of these sort of things uh, some of them mobile some of them more stationary and I think it's going to be a practical way to 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 condense and to make woody biomass a more marketable product Great, thanks, Darren. Yeah. Here's another question, um, a little bit off topic, but interesting. How long before the pinion junipers fill back in after a treatment like you showed earlier in the presentation? Um, it, it, it can be pretty variable the way that it's done. Um, I've saw examples, have seen examples where PJ has been treated. Uh, you know, it can be 20, 30 years, um, just roughly. I mean, there's a lot of chainings that have been done, which, uh, you know, you don't get any utilization out of chainings. It's a more historic pra practice where they, they took um, to a huge anchor chain from a ship and drug it between two tractors. And it's still being done on private lands and other uh, in, in and around Utah in some cases because it's so cheap, it's so economical, and it pushes over most of the trees. But in a lot of cases, landowners are going back and have to retreat things 20 years later because so much pops up. Um, and so it will take some, it will fill back in, and, and in a way, we see this as potentially a good thing as, as if we get that good at utilizing this resource, then uh, we'll want it to grow back and use it again and again. It, it's renewable. Great. We've got a question here about the CO2 production of the biomass fuels and how that compares with other fuels or wildfires. And, and really, is the CO2 an issue? Uh, great question. Um, I, in, in a nutshell, I'd like to say no. Depends on how you use it, of course. Compared to fires and, and wildfires, <laughs> there's just almost no comparison. There, you know, there's so much smoke that gets put out by a wildfire. We've all seen it. I've I've seen it and breathed a lot of it. And um, I think uh, so. These this as an example. You know, as I mentioned, depends on the technology. But the pyrolysis technology that we're talking about, this rotary kiln, it, it's all self-contained. The only um, it, it, the only thing that comes off of this trailer besides the the biochar and the bio oil is the the there is some CO and CO2 that comes off of that little generator that you saw. It's just that that's I don't know a 10 or 15 kilowatt generator um, that. It, so a Briggs and Stratton engine worth of CO and CO2 um, to um, process all of this material, tons and tons of this material. So, like a lawnmower's worth, um, which, which you know, lawnmowers <laughs> are known for producing lots for their small thing, but uh, not very much. I, I hope does that answer the question? You think? I think so, Darren. Thanks. 
Um, last question we have here, and it's from Dusty Moeller, who sounds like he's kind of got an interest in biomass here. Um, what are the biggest challenges moving forward? Ah, thank you for that question, fellow biocharist brother, Dusty. Um, Dusty uh, directs the uh, wood utilization program and biochar program in, out of Las Vegas, Nevada for UNR. Um, our biggest challenges moving forward, I think, are finding markets for these materials and improving the technologies so that these materials and these technologies can be uh, used and produced by the, the common person, the, 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 the arborist, the, the, the forester, the logger, um, and, and, and making the public more aware of the potential, the ecological benefits that I talked about today um, of woody biomass utilization. I think, I mean, I can add to it, you know, those challenges could come in political form. Um, I, I suspect um, if the last election, you know, uh, if, if, if Romney was our president now, uh, I got to guess that a lot of this biochar funding that we've seen would have gone away by the promises that he made, you know, for, for uh, aligning the budget. Uh, there's, there's no way that, that the, the, the funds that we have now would be available that, that, that I could guess. And so if we don't have a little bit of startup to kind of get the engine rolling and, and prove out these technologies on the ground in Utah, then it may not go anywhere. I, I see those are some of the bigger hurdles and challenges that we face.